morning. I think Matthew covered things pretty good there. We all have to be good and not get in trouble. <laughs> there you go. Uh, this morning we're continuing our journey through Paul's letter to the Christians in Rome. In the last message, we looked at how sexual adultery is the outflow of spiritual idolatry. And with that, we've been looking at how people suppress the truth and unrighteousness, how that leads to all sorts of other ungodliness, unrighteousness, and foolishness. Our text today continues in this line of thinking. So if you haven't heard the previous six messages, I would encourage you to go and check them out on YouTube or our app so that you can gain all of the context up to this point. Please turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 28 to 32, finishing off the first chapter. And I ask that if you're able, you would stand with me as we reverence the public reading of God's word. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Let's pray. Father, this morning we praise you because you are worthy of all praise. We thank you for the opportunity to gather here together, to sing, lift one voice of praise to you, to hear your word proclaimed. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of your word, how precious it is. May we treasure it always. Lord, this morning I ask that you would take your word, that you would deliver it to our minds and our hearts through the Holy Spirit, that your spirit would give us understanding and conviction and motivation and joy. Lord, that we would be consumed by your glory and a desire to honor and worship you. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for your faithfulness. Be with us in this time that we have of fellowship and of praise. May it all be a sweet and fragrant offering to you, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So far in Paul's letter, we've seen what seems like a lot of repetition. And Paul seems to be rephrasing and restating the same things over and over again in slightly different ways. Now, he certainly cared about his central points being understood. And just like Paul, I keep repeating and rephrasing the things that he said because it's greatly important to me that we all hear and understand Paul's words and how they apply to our lives today. So my plea to you this morning is to cast aside any frustration with repetition and truly try to focus on the significance of what Paul wrote all those years ago and how those things relate not only to our culture and our world today, but to each of us as individuals, specifically to yourself. I've broken this passage into four sections for our focus, so... Let's get into them. Number one, God must be acknowledged. God must be acknowledged. Look at the first half of verse 28. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God. First of all, I want to make sure we're all on the same page here. So who are the they that Paul refers to in the beginning of this verse? Is it just the homosexuals mentioned in the previous couple verses? No. Paul's continuing his thoughts that he began back in verse 18. He's talking about ungodly and unrighteous people who are without excuse. 
In verse 18, he said, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. So what Paul says here is applicable to all those who fall into this category of denying God, suppressing the truth, and refusing to honor the Lord as God. He's referring specifically to the unbelieving Gentiles of the world, but I think we do a disservice to ourselves and the text if we don't also see how these words apply more generally and to us. Now they did not see fit. The word that Paul uses here gives the idea of testing and examining, to scrutinize something, to prove it, and to recognize something as genuine after examining it. It's to deem it worthy. Paul's putting the onus on the people. They didn't do this. They didn't desire to do it. They didn't care to do it. To them, it wasn't necessary or important. And Paul says this in regards to acknowledging God. Now, this idea of acknowledging God is actually four separate words, meaning to hold or possess God in their knowledge, recognition, discernment, and acknowledgement. And this isn't a new concept in Romans 1. Paul said something very similar in verse 21. They did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. In other words, even though God has made himself clear through general revelation, like the created world and all things in it, people refuse to acknowledge him, refuse to worship him, refuse to thank him, refuse to submit to him and to follow him. Instead of considering the truth, standing in awe and falling to their knees in worship, they suppress the truth and unrighteousness and become futile in their thinking. Paul says their foolish hearts were darkened and claiming to be wise, seeking to be wise, they became fools. Paul is painting a picture of people that not only refuse to acknowledge and serve God, not only become fools in their ungodliness, but people that actually continue to dive further and further into their foolishness and futility. They make exchanges, and they continue to make more and more exchanges. They exchange the glory of the immortal God for idolatry. They exchange the truth about God for a lie. And they exchange natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And I want you to understand that this is what happens when we refuse to acknowledge God. When we don't see fit to keep God in our understanding and our appreciation. When we don't honor the Lord as God or give thanks to Him. We become fools. And in our foolish depravity, we continue to dive ever deeper into sin and depravity. And the terrifying thing is, God allows us to do it as part of our punishment. In fact, we've already seen two statements of God giving them up. We're about to look at a third. Previously, in verse 24, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity. In verse 26, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. With that in mind, let's see what Paul says about giving them up in today's text. The two depraved and debased minds. Depraved and debased minds. Look at the second half of verse 28. God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. Isn't that terrifying? God gave them up to a debased mind. Your translation may say defective, depraved, or reprobate. The word that Paul uses here, it's actually quite interesting. 
It's often used to speak of things like metal or soil. It's used to declare that something is unfit and unqualified. It would be used to describe a metal or a coin as being counterfeit or impure and worthless. It would be used to describe soil that was sterile and no good for any production. Paul paints a picture here of something that fails to pass the test and is unfit for its intended or desired purpose. Now, I want you to think about that in the context of our minds. Mind being our brains, our reasoning abilities, our intellect. As I said before, the mind doesn't just fall into some degree of this state of worthlessness. It actually continues to worsen. Our minds become continually darkened and defective in our sin. This is part of the devastation and danger of sin. It's part of the danger and destruction that accompanies refusing to honor the Lord as God and give thanks to Him. In verse 21, Paul said, They became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And verse 22, Claiming to be wise, they became fools. And as I said when we looked at those verses, this should give us some serious pause when we consider why we're going to people in this position of mind and thought when it comes to truths about this world, our lives, and how we should live. They are fools. Their minds are futile. God has given them over to depraved minds. And this isn't a localized issue. This happens across the board, across the globe across every tribe and tongue and nation. No one is exempt from this principle and punishment. When people choose to worship the creature rather than the creator, when we choose to sit upon the throne of our hearts as our own gods and worship ourselves, when we set our desires, our affections, and our worship on anyone and anything other than God as we far too often do, God responds to such treason and foolish wickedness by letting us sink much deeper in the slime pit we've pursued. As I said in previous weeks, He allows us to suffer the consequences of our own choices. He allows us to have what we want. And this problem doesn't just impact individuals. Think about it. If everyone who rejects God in this way is somewhere down this road of futility and foolishness, then all of society is impacted. And without something significant like a mass revival or the repentance of a nation like we saw with Nineveh, then the society will continue to go ever deeper into depraved and reprobate minds. Why was the flood necessary? Why were fire and brimstone necessary for Sodom and Gomorrah? I'd ask you to imagine what that would possibly look like. But there's really no need to do so. We live in such a time. We live in a time of seemingly unrestrained wickedness, though much is still restrained. Surely unrestrained stupidity and futility of thought. In 1998, Piper said, Paul's teaching about why a society degenerates into unrestrained, debauched, destructive evil is unlike any analysis you would read today. One of the reasons for this is that when a society is sinking into moral decay, one of the traits of that decay is the inability to see what is happening. The social mind becomes so defective in the moral decadence that it doesn't have the categories or the framework to recognize evil for what it really is. And since the day that Piper spoke those words, it seems like the degeneracy of thought and action has rapidly accelerated. In fact, we're at such a rate of decaying logic, reasoning, and morals that it's hard to even keep up 
with all of the changes and the elements of so-called progress. And please hear me out. I'm, I'm not some gloomy doomsayer pessimist who's trying to, to make the world out to be some horrible, wicked place. But I am seeing what people like Jesus and his apostles said even then and what many faithful, godly men and women throughout history have said and what seems so painfully evident in our world today. And if you're not seeing these things or you don't think that things are that wicked or you wouldn't characterize our current society as being given over to depraved minds, then I'm concerned for you. I'm worried that perhaps you've been lulled asleep or there's degrees to which you've fallen into some futility and foolishness of thought. I say this because I'm genuinely concerned. I'm heartbroken over the state of so many professing Christians today and how fast we are to throw away truth. To try and argue away or reason away the instructions of God based upon our own so-called intellect and our own experiences. It's devastating to me how frequently I have conversations, not only with professing Christians, but with pastors, with seminary professors, with denominational leaders who don't even believe many basic fundamental teachings of Scripture or who seem to have little to no conviction of what God has said in His Word. I'm concerned. I'm worried about how much this depravity of thought has entered into the church today because we keep making the kinds of exchanges that Paul talks about here. And because we don't honor the Lord as God, at least not in many of the ways that He's called us to. I'm heartbroken because I'm aware of my own depravity, my own weakness. I'm intimately aware of my own sin and my own wandering heart. I know how quickly the things of this world can start appealing to me, how rapidly my thoughts can start to change, and how loud some of those seductive whispers of change or self or pride or whatever can be. Folks, this isn't stuff to take lightly or flippantly. Whether for our own personal application or for understanding the world around us and the profound need of those who don't know God, this stuff matters. And we can see the sin that comes from our idolatry and misplaced worship. We can see the sin that comes from all of the exchanges that we make. We can see the sin that comes from depraved and debased minds. This foolishness, futility, and worthlessness of mind have an impact. More sins flow out from them. And Paul gets specific about some of these markers in people's lives. Number three, filled with wickedness. Filled with wickedness. Look at verses 29 to 31. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Now, you don't have to raise your hand, but I certainly could. You know, who does this apply to? Do some of these words or even all of these words apply to you? What is that? It's sin in our lives. It's our brokenness in this fallen world. It's the depravity of mind and the pull of the flesh that we have to battle each day as we put our flesh to death and take up our cross and follow Christ. Now, the genuine believer isn't filled with all manner of these, but they still show up. And Paul's words here are a devastating description of humanity. Evil, 
jealous, murdering. I mean, think of what Jesus said about murder and our hearts. Strife, lying, attacking, gossiping, slandering, haters of God, insolent, proud, braggers, thinking of more ways to be evil and creating evil things, being disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. What a list. What a description. And yet we need to understand that this isn't even a comprehensive or exhaustive list of all things human or all things sinful or all things depraved. We know that because there's many times where other sins are listed. They aren't all here. But Paul's idea, I think, is definitely being communicated here. You know, in the depravity of mind... We don't even recognize sin for what it is. We can't even think clearly about sin. Discernment is absent. And no matter how discerning we may think we are, we become self-deceived. That's why we need accountability. That's why we need a local church. That's why we need a pastor. That's why we need the preaching of God's Word and the revealing and convicting power of the Holy Spirit. This is why we need God's Word. One of many reasons. Without Spirit-empowered preaching by faithful, godly men and the conviction and accountability that accompanies that, I don't know where I'd be, but I know it wouldn't be standing here behind a pulpit. In fact, if I could hazard a guess, knowing myself, I would say prison or dead. Maybe that's not true for you. I think it would be for me. These things are vital. They're not optional. Piper said what we need is a word from outside our defective world and our depraved thinking. We need a word from God. And we may certainly expect such a word to be very strange because we have become strangers to the reality of God in a very self-absorbed age. That was also said in 1998. Since then, our society has become exceptionally more focused, increasingly more focused on self. This is a perfect thing to think about as we move to the final verse, because it speaks directly to things like accountability and the ways that we see our culture running headlong into sin together while enticing everyone to redefine and question what God has said, just as the serpent did in the garden. Number four, acceptance, approval, and practice. Acceptance, approval, and practice. Look at verse 32. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. So here again, we see that Paul makes a statement regarding people's knowledge. In verse 19, he said, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. Verse 21, For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. Verse 28, And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God. Now Paul's restating, he's making it clear that they are without excuse. God is just. Punishment is deserved. Rejection is a choice. Refusing God is a choice. Worshiping the creature rather than the creator is a choice. And even though the people know of God's existence, know that he deserves all glory, honor, and praise, and know his holy decrees and the serious nature of the consequences, they sin anyways. They deny and reject him Anyways, perhaps you've heard people say things like, I don't care, I'll just party in hell. 
Or I don't want anything to do with, the, with heaven if the God of the Bible is there. Or I don't enjoy or like God now. Why would I want to worship him for all of eternity? I've heard and read such devastating statements. My heart aches for those who would dare to say such things. Father, have mercy on them for they don't know what they're doing. But Paul says more than just the fact that they sin regardless of consequences and regardless of their knowledge of who God is. Worse yet, they give approval to those who practice such wicked deeds. They encourage ungodliness. They promote and appreciate sin and they entice others to join in. And certainly, we see the reality of this practice in major ways in our world today. TV, movies, and media of all sorts I mean, the entertainment business is almost entirely built off of this very principle. Celebrities and athletes, much, probably most of the world of academia, and sadly, even many professing Christians and church leaders. Even a cursory glance at Scripture can inform us that those who lead others astray and encourage others in sin will be held accountable and severely punished. Again, this is a terrifying thing to consider. Especially if, like me, and like many that I talk to in our church, you have friends and family, people that you love and care about, who are in this position. They're denying God worshiping themselves, and living in the futility of a depraved mind. Worse yet, they may even be leading others into the same dark pit of misery and death. In fact, they likely are encouraging others in sin and promoting it. And for us who have had our eyes opened by the light of Christ for us, who are having our minds renewed and are being sanctified day by day, the thought of our loved ones being so blinded, so foolish, and so condemned should absolutely break our hearts. And in such brokenness, we ought to labor diligently in prayer for them. We ought to eagerly share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. Dear people, we've looked at a lot of difficult and depressing stuff this morning. And though looking at problems can be helpful in waking us from our slumber, calling us to action, or renewing our convictions, There's little fruit or good that comes if we don't also examine solutions and hope. And there is great news this morning. Great hope available to those who deny God and suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Great news for those who have useless, depraved minds. And great news for us who have been saved but still wrestle and battle against the world, the flesh, and the devil. Jesus Christ came and died to set captives free. He came to heal the sick, give sight to the blind, cleanse the unclean, give strength to the weak, and purify our hearts and minds. So if you haven't experienced a saving relationship with Jesus, then please come and talk to me later, because I would love to share with you the greatest message of hope that you will ever hear. And if you're here this morning and you profess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, praise God. Be encouraged this morning, despite your sin and your failures, because Jesus has overcome the world. He's conquered death, hell, and the grave. He has all authority in heaven and on earth, and He can accomplish all that He's promised to do and equip us for all that He's called us to do. In your weakness, rest in Him. In your sin, fall at His feet. In your struggles, 
run to him. For in Christ, we have all that we need for life and godliness. We have all that we need for sanctification and holiness. We have all we need for wisdom and purity. It's all in Him and through Him. So seek Him. Cling to Him and rest in Him. Houston Baptist Church, I urge you to examine your own heart. Examine your thought life, beliefs, and practices. Examine your lifestyle, words, and actions. We're told to test yourself, examine yourself to see if you are really in the faith. Are you honoring the Lord as God and giving thanks to Him? Are you worshiping the creature or the Creator? Are you making some of these ungodly exchanges in your life? What position does God hold in your life? What portion does He receive of your time, talents, treasure, and heart? Are you captivated by Him and driven to honor and glorify Him? Do you honor the Lord as God and worship Him in praise and thanksgiving? As Paul said in Romans 12, 1 and 2, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but renew your mind. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is good and acceptable and perfect, that you'll discern what the will of God is for you. Be renewed. Be transformed. And offer your life as a living sacrifice. Let's pray. Father, you are so, so good. Your mercy is unending. Your grace is abundant. And Lord, as we look to you, as we come to you in repentance, as we run to you in longing and we cling to you, we can say, oh, my cup overflows. Because in you, Lord, there is the abundance, the overabundance of everything that is good. Lord, you know how fickle we are, how quick we are to forget who you are and what you've done, what you've said, what you've called us to, and what you've made available to us. We're quick to fall into the narratives and ideologies of this world, to listen to so many voices. Lord, help us to silence all of these voices to hear one voice, yours. God, that we would be a people of the word who know your will for us, who know your goodness toward us because we love you and we love your word and we seek your word and in it we find all truth, we find all things needed for life and godliness. Forgive us, Lord, for our wandering. Equip us. Challenge us. Convict us. Draw us to yourself. Fill us with peace beyond understanding. With conviction and hope to walk boldly through this world, this fallen world filled with lost and dying people who need to know about you. Make us bearers and deliverers of hope that we would take the beautiful gospel, that we would trust the power that resides in the truth of who you are and what you've done and that we would boldly proclaim it to the world. 
but we would preach it to our own hearts. Sanctify us, purify us, Lord. Make us more like you and continue to do that each and every day we pray. Thank you that you do this work, that we can trust in you, that you are faithful. Amen.